Hi there. My name is Eduardo Magalhães III. I'm a professor of political science at Simpson College. Uh, I'm actually starting my 30th year teaching here at Simpson, uh, so I'm somewhat of a seasoned veteran uh, in terms of uh, teaching. Um, Simpson College is a small liberal arts college just south of uh, Des Moines in central Iowa. It is the home of the uh, reigning two-time national champion Pi Delta Kappa debate team. Uh, actually, three of the last four years, we've won the national championship there. Uh, also, it is the home to uh, <clears throat> a model UN team that has won 27 outstanding delegation awards in the last 10 years. And I am uh, very honored to be involved in both of those programs. Uh, so I'm very excited to be here on behalf of Simpson College and College Board uh, to talk to you about comparative politics. Uh, I've been teaching uh, comparative politics, obviously, for 30 years. And to me, comparative politics is the purest form of the study of political science, uh, because only we can only truly understand political systems in comparisons with other political systems. Without context or comparison, um, <clears throat> we don't know what it means to be a one-party system or a one-party dominant system or a two-party system or a multi-party system. Without being able to compare those systems with other systems, we don't really understand what the consequences or impact of those differences really are. Uh, that's why, to me, we do comparative politics. Uh, and today, I'm going to be talking to you about what I think is one of the central concepts in the study of comparative politics, uh, and that is political legitimacy. Uh, political legitimacy, uh, according to the course uh, and exam description, it refers to whether a government's constituents believe their government has the right to use power the way that they do. Uh, as you can imagine, if you've studied any political science so far in your high school careers, uh, there are a ton of different definitions of political legitimacy. Uh, to me, what they all boil down to is why do we let rulers make decisions on our behalf, right? Why do we allow someone else to tell us what to do? Uh, that's basically what political legitimacy boils down to. Now, some of you might say, well, the reason that we make, that we allow decision makers to make decisions on our behalf is because we have to, right? Because there are laws, there's police, there's rules, there's consequences of not obeying the law. And certainly to some extent, that is true and certainly is very true in some of the countries that we're looking at in this class. Uh, if you're talking about China, for example, uh, party membership in China adds up to about 90 million people. And those 90 million members of the Communist Party of China are divided into 4.36 million grassroots organizations, uh, what some scholars refer to as primary party units. Uh, and those primary party units, uh, what I often say in class is comparable to in the Bible, wherever two of you are gathered together, so shall I be. Uh, that's kind of the way the Communist Party is. Wherever two or three members of the Communist Party are, that's where the party is as well. Uh, those grassroots organizations are present in every rural township, in every residential neighborhood, in every state-owned enterprise. And in fact, they're present in 53% of private corporations. Uh, and so that obviously provides the party with a tremendous mechanism of verification that people are following the party line. Uh, in fact, uh, if you would turn to your copies of Perestroika by Mikhail Gorbachev, I'm sorry, you don't have your own personal copy of Perestroika? I guess I'm the only one. Um, he says in his book, which of course was about the reform movement in the Soviet Union, does this mean that the party's leading role can weaken? Uh, doubts of that kind have indeed been expressed. But as the ruling party, it has, again, he's talking about Russia, it has all the requisite levers to imp implement its reading, leading role. And the most important lever of all are the 20 million communists carrying out the party's political line in all areas of life. Uh, so if Xi Jinping were writing this, he would say, uh, as the ruling party, it has all the requisite levers to implement its leading role. And the most important lever of all are the 90 million members of the Communist Party of China 
carrying out the party's political will in all areas of life. Uh, when I teach about communist politics in China, that's one of the things that I always note is it's amazing to think about the penetration of that institution through society. So yeah, in China, certainly part of the reason you do what rulers tell you to do is because the Communist Party is present everywhere. If we look at Russia, uh, we see here Alexei Navalny uh, in front of us, uh, poisoned for the second time uh, during the time that he's been the leading opponent and leading uh, critic of the Putin regime in Russia, uh, currently in Germany for treatment for his, uh, <clears throat> for his uh, poisoning. Um, obviously, we know that in Russia, if you oppose the regime, there can be some pretty serious consequences. Tax fraud, uh, charges bring against, being brought against you, being pushed abroad, and sometimes even being abroad doesn't protect you, as we know. Uh, so again, sure, I'm gonna do what the regime tells me to do because I'm afraid of my for my life. Uh, and then obviously in Iran, uh, you'll learn about the Guardian Council, uh, which has responsibility for deciding which candidates can run in the elections in Iran. And so if you don't follow the government line, then you may not ever have even the opportunity to participate in politics through election, right? So I'm not suggesting that these things aren't true. But what I wanna emphasize today in this discussion is that all political systems are legitimized by a variety of variables. And our job as comparative political scientists is to recognize that variety and to recognize how sources of legitimacy may ebb and flow over time, that at certain points, one source of legitimacy may have it more influence than another, and then later on, a different source of legitimacy may be important. But in all systems, even these authoritarian systems, other source of, sources of legitimacy are essential to the survival and durability of the regime. Now again, as you can imagine, there are a variety of different organizations of sources of legitimacy. Uh, this is one that I uh, like. Uh, there are others obviously available depending on what textbook you use. Uh, the first one on this list is procedural, uh, what Max Weber would have called rational or legal. Uh, basically it means that we grant to decision makers the right to rule because of a procedure, typically elections, that we accept as legitimate, right? Uh, you won the election fair and square, maybe I didn't vote for you, but because you won the election fair, fair and square, you can make decisions on my behalf, right? So that's procedural legitimacy. There's also legitimacy based on performance, right? You have the right to rule as long as I'm enjoying benefits from your rule, right? As long as I am safe, as long as things are stable, as long as the economy is doing well, right? As long as those things are true, hey, I'm happy for you to make decisions on my behalf. Uh, personality, uh, again, what Max Weber referred to as charisma, is also another reason that people grant to decision makers the right to make decisions on their behalf. Um, you have a unique understanding of our country, you have a unique vision for the future, uh, you have, again, the term charisma is valid. You, there's just something about you that makes me willing to submit to your authority, right? That is absolutely true as a source of legitimacy. Uh, sometimes nationalism is a source of legitimacy, right? That I am defending the national interest, I am defending national culture, I am defending national priorities, I'm defending national values, and because I am so good at defending these things, that's why you should continue to allow me to rule. That's why you should continue to defer to my authority in making decisions on your behalf. Uh, tradition, somewhat similar to nationalism, uh, that there may be sources of authority that are based on precedent. This is always who's been in charge. This is the office that has always been the one that made decisions before us. Uh, we've always deferred in this, in this situation or, or along these lines. Uh, tradition is a very, very powerful source of legitimacy. Uh, precedent is a very powerful political dynamic uh, that that influences uh, the way people behave. We do this thing because that's the way it's always been done. Uh, ideology, of course, is also another source of legitimacy uh, that because of a particular philosophy, because of a particular theoretical orientation, because of a particular set of principles, 
this is what grants you the authority to make decisions on my behalf, right? Because you are the embodiment of this ideology, you are the expression of this philosophy, and so that's why you can make decisions on my behalf. Uh, and then finally, religion uh, is certainly a source of legitimacy. If you've studied any Western history, uh, you know that for many, many years in Western history, uh, the reason that rulers had the right to rule was because God said that they had the right to rule, right? I am your king because my family is the family anointed by God to be the rulers of this country. And so that's why you defer to me is because God has picked me uh, to be the ruler of this country. What I want you to appreciate in our discussion today is again, that no country relies entirely on just one of these things. Uh, that what I want you to see with just a handful of examples from the courses, uh, we just don't have enough time to go through all of them, uh, but just with three of the countries in the comparative politics course, I want you to see the range of sources of legitimacy that support or again, ensure that the people of those countries uh, believe that the government has the right to make decisions on their behalf. Uh, so we're gonna start with China. Uh, and you might initially think that, oh, well, obviously the main source of legitimacy in China, if we're gonna let go of the coercion stuff and fear, we're gonna say it's ideology, right? Because China is a communist country. We know that all communist countries are founded on the ideology of the communist party. And that is certainly true. Um, the, the communist ideology, if you trace it, from Marx through Lenin and Stalin and then into Mao, uh, there's that very strong tendency that the party is a vanguard and members of the party are uniquely endowed with insight and understanding of Marxism and Marxist principles and Maoist principles and Deng Xiaoping principles. And so they are uniquely able to apply those principles to current circumstances, right? It, it reminds me a little of, of, you know, parents and children, right? Um, you may think as a child that, oh, well, I should do this, or I should do that, or I should be free to do this, or free to do that, but your parents know better, right? They've been around for a long time. They know that playing in the street, not a good idea, right? Or playing with the stove, not a good idea, right? Because they've been around for a while. They know that you could be hurt. The ideological uh, foundation of legitimacy is somewhat similar to that, right? The, the Communist Party, even now that, of course, the Communist Party of China is not based on Marxist or Leninist or even Maoist principles, uh, there's still this legacy that the party knows best, right? And so there's deference to the party. Uh, but tradition is also an extremely important source of legitimacy in China. If you look through the history of China, and it's important to remember that you can trace China as a named entity back for 5,000 years, right? As early as, what is that, the 3000 BC, um, there are written references to the Middle Kingdom, to a political entity that today we, could, we would call China. Uh, and so that tradition and the tradition of the son of heaven, the emperor was referred to the son of heaven, and the son of heaven had the mandate of heaven, right? That's what gave to the son of heaven the right to make decisions, the right to be the ruler. We see all the way to this day, there's a legacy of that tradition, right? That the current leader of China is still, at least in some sort of cultural sense, considered to be the son of heaven, and is also considered to have the mandate of heaven. Uh, when Mao Zedong passed away, when Deng Xiaoping passed away, there were major national disasters, uh, earthquakes, uh, floods, those kind of things, that again, traditionally, were seen as precursors of the withdrawal of the mandate of heaven, right? When those things happened, people thought, okay, heaven has withdrawn its mandate from this emperor, we need to establish a new imperial family. People thought the same kind of way when Mao passed away. Oh, yeah, of course Mao passed away now because there was that sign, the earthquake was a sign that the mandate of heaven was being withdrawn. And there's even discussion of that now. You, you can read articles that refer to whether in this sort of traditional kind of sense, Xi Jinping is losing the mandate of heaven because of the COVID pandemic or because of the protests in Hong Kong or something like that, right? So again, tradition, very powerful source of legitimacy in China. Obviously, again, if you know anything about China, you know that personality is an extremely important source of legitimacy, 
right? That Mao Zedong, Deng Xiaoping, Xi Jinping. Uh, Xi Jinping, in fact, is the first ruler since Deng Xiaoping to have his philosophy endowed in the party constitution, right? That's something that's very different from Russian communism was the, the lifting up of individual personalities and individual philosophies as a sort of guiding source of policy making within uh, the Communist Party. Uh, and so clearly, you know, Xi Jinping has, is building on that cult of personality as a source of his authority. Uh, and then finally, you, can't, you simply cannot ignore the effectiveness of the Chinese Communist Party since the reforms began in 1979. Uh, if you look at GDP per capita in China, Back in 1979, according to the World Bank, it was $347, $347. Today, in 2019, it is 8,254, right? Which not, might not seem very, like very much, but if you think about the fact that that is 24 times the GDP per capita that people enjoyed, uh, what is that, 31 years ago, 41 years ago, uh, you can imagine that people would be saying, wow, this is pretty good, just as a comparison, right? Just, just to appreciate what that represents. If U.S. GDP per capita had grown at the same rate in the last 40 years, our GDP per capita today would be $300,000. $300,000 would be the GDP per capita in the U.S. instead of $65,000, according to the World Bank, right? I think you and I would both agree, yeah, if our GDP per capita was 300,000 a year, go ahead and keep ruling. You're doing a great job, okay? So again, all of these things are sources of legitimacy for uh, China. If we look at Russia, again, we might say, oh, well, the reason that Putin stays in power is because of the coercion, right? It's because of the fear. But again, I think we're missing something if we're not looking at other sources of legitimacy that clearly Russia has a tradition of strong leadership. Uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 was preceded by seven decades of authoritarian communist rule and, of course, centuries of czarist autocracy. Uh, in fact, at the time of the collapse, some would argue Russia, in its hundreds and hundreds of years of history, had exactly eight months of experience with democracy. Right. And so, again, when you think about precedent, Putin isn't going way out of what's normal for Russia. Right. It's normal for Russia to have a fairly autocratic, a fairly authoritarian leader. That's what people are used to. And so people are going to defer to the authority of that individual. Again, obviously, if you've looked at pictures of Putin, if you've Googled images of Putin, uh, you know that his charisma, his personality, his manliness, right? He's playing hockey, he's hunting bears, he's riding a horse bareback and so on. Uh, all of that is endowing him with authority because, you know, this is the kind of Russian that we can support, right? This is the kind of Russian that we can get behind, right? And so clearly, as we would say in Latin America, he has that personalismo, uh, that, that authority that's drawn from his personality. There's no question about that. Uh, and also, obviously, nationalism uh, is an important source of Vladimir Putin's legitimacy. Um, I don't think we as Americans can appreciate the consequences, the cultural consequences, the political consequences, even the psychological consequences of losing an empire like Russia did, of going from one of the two most powerful countries in the world to being just about an afterthought at the international level. So if I have a government, right, if I'm Vladimir Putin and I have a government that is aggressively asserting itself around the world in Ukraine, in Georgia, uh, establishing a physical foothold in the Middle East and Syria, which even the Soviet Union couldn't do, right? Even the Soviet Union did not have a physical foothold in the Middle East, Russia has one there now, reclaiming Crimea as a part of Russia, annexing the Crimea. Hey, that's great, right? I'm excited. Russia is finally back on the world stage where it belongs. I'm happy to have Putin make decisions on my behalf, right? And then finally, in terms of performance, no, obviously, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, oh, yeah, the Russian economy is 
chugging along just as well or has grown just as fast as the Chinese economy. Uh, that's clearly not the case. But again, according to World Bank data, the GDP per capita in Russia was 1,330 in 1999 when Vladimir Putin came to power. And today it's 11,288. Again, not fantastic, but still eight and a half times larger than it was in 1999. Again, for comparison, if US GDP had grown at the same rate from 1999 to today, our GDP per capita would be $106,000, right? So 40,000 more than what it currently is, right? That would put us more along the lines of, you know, Luxembourg and some of those, you know, really wealthy micro states in Europe, right? We would be more in that ballpark than where we are now. So again, you can understand why Russians would say, hey, you know, we're a lot better off than we were 21 years ago when uh, Vladimir Putin first came to power. Uh, but this isn't only true of the authoritarian regimes. There's also this kind of variety when it comes to democratic regimes. So that's why I want to finish uh, our examples by talking about the United Kingdom. Uh, now, again, we might want to argue that, oh, well, you know, procedure, democracy, democratic legitimacy, that's the really the only source of authority for uh, the United Kingdom. But again, I think we need to recognize that it's not quite that simple. Uh, I mean, if you look at the recent uh, election of Boris Yeltsin, that is when Boris Yeltsin became the prime minister of Great Britain, right before they held the, the general election, Boris Johnson became the prime minister of the United Kingdom by winning a majority of the votes of 138,000 members of the Conservative Party. 138,000 members of the party. Right. Just as comparison, because I'm from Iowa, if we look at turnout in Lynn County, which is the second largest, not the largest, the second largest county in Iowa, uh, home to Cedar Rapids, uh, which, of course, you may know uh, was was affected very dramatically by our derecho storm here uh, a couple of years, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the turnout in Lynn County was about the same size as the number of people who voted for the prime minister of one of the largest, most populous, strongest nations in Europe, right? So I don't know about you, but if I'm basing legitimacy on electoral dynamics, I'm gonna be a little suspicious of Boris Yeltsin's legitimacy, okay? So again, it's not just about procedure, it's obviously about other things as well, right? And so clearly tradition is an extremely important part of the, the, the legitimacy of the regime in the United Kingdom. Unlike virtually every other country in the world, the United Kingdom has not experienced a major, disruptive, revolutionary break in its political system. Uh, obviously, the regime today is not the same regime that was in power 200 years ago when the US broke away from Great Britain. Uh, but there is no point, there's no year, there's no date where we say, ah, before this date, the United Kingdom was a monarchical, authoritarian kind of regime, but after this date, it was a parliamentary democracy, right? There's no breaking point like that. It was a very gradual, evolutionary kind of process where it went from the monarch was the you know, final word on everything to the monarch just cuts ribbons and gives a speech on Christmas, right? Um, that happened in a very gradual kind of fashion. So again, in terms of the source of authority, this regime has been around forever, right? It's not something that came to office 100 years ago or a couple hundred years ago. This is a regime that can be traced back for <clears throat> hundreds and hundreds of years, right? So that's why they have the authority to rule on my behalf. And again, I don't think we can ignore performance, right? Even democracies have to deliver, right? Uh, if you're not performing economically, if you're not providing stability, if you're not providing public safety, even democracies are, gonna are going to fail. Okay, and so while uh, the United Kingdom may not be the strongest economy in Europe, uh, it certainly has regularly been one of the strongest economies in Europe, one of the largest economies in Europe, and certainly the people of the United Kingdom live a pretty comfortable life, right? They're comfortable members of the first world uh, who you know have everything that they need, and so that also is obviously part 
of what gives legitimacy to the regime in the United Kingdom. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, what I hope you take from this discussion is that political legitimacy is not a simple single source uh, in each country in this class, right? That you can take the six countries in comparative politics and say, here's the source for this country, here's the one source for this country, here's the one source for this country, right? It's not that simple. Um, <clears throat> that each country is <laughs> legitimized by a variety of different factors. And as comparative political scientists, we must be aware of this variety because legitimacy is very closely tied to the stability and durability of regimes, right? Why do regimes remain in place? Political legitimacy is an important source of that. So we must be aware of all of the facets of legitimacy that lead, lead, lead citizens to uh, grant their government the right to rule on their behalf. Now, uh, just as a, a final point on this, uh, I was a graduate student from 1987 to 1991. Um, again, you can do the math then to see how old I am. Um, and I was literally studying Eastern European politics as the communist regimes in the region were collapsing. Uh, regimes that we in political science thought maybe wouldn't be around forever, but certainly were not likely to collapse in the near future, right? We did not think that they were in, on the verge of imminent collapse. And yet, again, in a very short period of time, almost all of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe did so. Uh, one of my very first classes when I started teaching here at Simpson College was the politics of the Soviet Union and China in the fall of 1991. And so literally, the very topic of the class ceased to exist as a sovereign nation a couple of weeks after the final exam because the Soviet Union ceased to exist uh, at the end of December in 1991. And, and again, many of us thought, okay, look out China, right? This is what is happening with communism. Communism is collapsing all over the world. And so collapse is pretty imminent for China as well. Well, uh, I don't know about you, but it's 30 years later, and actually almost 40 years later, still not seeing it. Right? I'm still not seeing the collapse of communism. Um, uh, <clears throat> we need, the, what, what political legitimacy is about is that we need to recognize that there are other sources of political legitimacy, right? That maybe communism as a source of legitimacy isn't as strong in China as it once was, but those other sources of legitimacy are as strong, if not stronger, sources of legitimacy. And so, again, I'm certainly not going to sit here and predict that, oh, the Chinese Communist Party is going to rule China for the next 50 years, right? That would be crazy for me to make a prediction like that. But again, the reason it's still here, even though communism collapsed everywhere else, or virtually everywhere else, is because there are other sources of legitimacy, right? Uh, and so uh, I thank you uh, for your time today. Uh, it's been my pleasure to talk to you about comparative politics. I, I hope that as you're getting into comparative politics, you also will be inspired or at least intrigued. There are 197 countries out there and every single one has at least a slightly different political orientation. And it is just absolutely fascinating. I teach Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East, right? I teach everything basically except Africa, and I love all of it. So I hope that this course inspires you at least to follow up a little bit when you go on to college and take a little bit of comparative politics there. Um, in conclusion, uh, I hope you have a very successful year. I certainly hope that you stay safe uh, in wherever you're at, uh, and uh, I look forward to grading your comparative politics exam uh, in June. Uh, thank you very much.